Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning and Father for, Lord, the wonderful words we are allowed to sing that are truth, that are promises. And Lord, we are grateful, Father, for your goodness and your grace in them. We pray, Father, this morning as we come, Lord, in our, whatever is going on in our hearts, Father, that you will, Lord, arrest those thoughts and you bring them, Father, to the altar before you, knowing that, God, you are the one who upholds all things and that you desire to hear from us. Lord, you desire to and already know our needs before we even ask for them. And so we come to you this morning. Lord, we ask, Father, to meet us with your word. And Lord, build up your church that we might be ready, Lord, not only for this week, but for, Lord, all that you have, uh, Lord, prepared for us, whether, Lord, difficult or, Lord, easy. We're grateful, Father, that you are in them. And you enabled us to walk through them, Lord, this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I think, just a reminder, I think I said Titus starts this week, it starts next week. I'm sure you caught that, ladies. And so, just in the order of things. Also, you know, I want to thank the, somebody who brought me a little treat up here. I, I didn't know it was mine, but I think it is because it has cinnamon on it. So whoever did that, you know, just keep it coming. It's all good. Let's take our Bibles and turn to the letter of Thessalonians. We've been studying together in these last weeks. I was going to, forgot I was going to share a picture. Uh, I didn't get it up. Uh, David Nelson is, you know, kind of in Thessalonica. So I was like, you know, sent a picture uh, of the uh, the sea there saying that uh, I think I think Paul had a, had some beautiful sunsets in Thessalonica, among all the other troubles. But, but, uh, but uh, just a reminder that what we're speaking of is is a place, it's scriptural. It's there, and and uh, we can go and see it and and observe it. And here we'll read about it in relation to the church. So here in chapter two, where we began last week in. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 17, Paul shared, as we know, his concern for the church. And as we noted, Paul's concern, as we read really in verse 5, was that he was concerned that because of having to depart, because of severe circumstances, and, and for themselves as well, because of the persecution for the gospel, he feared, as we read in verse 5 of chapter 3, that the tempter might have tempted them and, he says, made their labor would have been in vain. We talked about this last week, but we know, we know and are reminded every day that there is a tempter. Uh, his name is Satan. He speaks it here. We, he, he and his demons. He, has, he, as we know from Scripture, that he was an angel of highest rank, one of the anointed cherubs we read in Ezekiel chapter 28, whom it says unrighteousness was found and he rebelled against God, leading a host of angels with him. And he sets himself against God and his people. And he did so from the very beginning as we read in Genesis chapter 3 and throughout the scriptures. Yet we know as well that he continues on, he tempts all men, as we, as we see in our text here, as we read in verse 5, we remember that he tempted, sought to tempt Jesus, yet Jesus was without sin. He infests the world with his lies as the father of lies, John chapter 8, verse 44. He is the wolf in sheep's clothing, Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. He, is a, he masquerades as an angel of light, as Paul said in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 14, and seeks to deceive and hinder the work of the gospel as we read in chapter 2 of Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, uh, verse, chapter 2, verse 18. And here with the Thessalonians, Satan used men of the world system to set itself against the believers at Thessalonica. Acts 17, remember, it was the Jews who started it, but they brought the world that is the Gentiles up against the believers, stirred up a crowd. 
And the reason that they gave for this altercation, this standoff, this accusation against those who were new believers there, you might remember in Acts 17 that they were shouting these men uh, about these men and says they had to upset the world. They've upset the world. And that's really the ministry of Christianity is to upset the world. And they were doing their job. It was the right thing. And so they got it right. But when we upset the world because of truth, it agitates the world. They react to it. And we see it even today. We see the, it today as, as though God has set boundaries for Satan. He is using him for his purposes. He even uses Satan to sanctify the church. But Satan, though he cannot win, seeks to win until he will be judged at the great white throne judgment. Remember that Satan has no control over the believer, as I've said before, other than what the believer gives to him. What the believer allows him is willing to, 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 to his willingness to listen to his lies and believe them. And so here as we read in our text, Satan indeed is the enemy of the church, the God of this world system. And so here as the Thessalonians dealt with them, Paul was concerned about them. We know that nothing has changed in the world. We see it today. We see it very relevantly here in the present time, especially with the issue of abortion, the issue of of, of homosexuality, the issue of, of, of gender, all of these things, the issue of marriage, all of these things which the church and, and God has made clear his standard. And yet because it doesn't fit the world genre, the world belief, then the world, the church is standing against the world, standing against the, as we see here in Scripture, the world agenda. We have upset the world. And so it is that there's attacks that come to the church not only from front but also from behind, from within the church where he, as we just said, is an angel, seeks to be an angel of light. He's a sheep, uh, a, a wolf in sheep's clothing. And Satan knows how to work subtly to behind the scenes as well. Even the church to seek the church to slowly become more like the world. To be less serious about truth, more focused on felt needs, majoring on the programs, pageantry, and more pers for more persons rather than pursuing the word of God and the priority of the glory of God. And he will relentlessly pursue this. So these things are very relevant. What's this convey for the church? It means that we need to be aware of Satan's schemes. We need to be aware of his falsehoods. That we are not easily drawn away and deceived both from within and from without. Again, the latest attack on the church is, is COVID. Not COVID itself, not the, not the virus itself, but, but what people have tried to do with it. And especially that which even those who are called to protect tried to control. The government seeking authority over the church this last two years, seeking to, to dictate the ability to gather, to even sing, to even sing in church. All in the guise of taking care of you. And unfortunately, much of the church has been given over to it and given over to the ideologies as well. See words as wokeness and all kinds of things that have become the theology. Instead of conforming to the word of God, we allow ourselves to be conformed to the ideologies of the God of this world. Little G, as I shared last week. The one who blinds the eyes I was thinking of this in relation to California, using Bible verses to uh, condone abortion. 
loving your neighbor. Apparently, babies aren't neighbors. It's interesting, the, the, the motto of, of uh, California is Eureka. I, I, I found it, I think it is. But several years prior to that theme, that, that model that came out, do you know what they wanted their theme to be or that it was proposed as a theme, as a motto, state motto? In God we trust. It's that which is we put on our dollar bill. It's the, it's the state motto of Florida. And they have a great need to trust the Lord and all that's going on as our prayers are for them. But it's become, unfortunately, a state of, of opportunity to take the lives of, of children. And all will stand before the Lord because of it. And we're thankful for the grace that God gives us even for those who have fallen into it. That there is forgiveness and there is redemption. And there is peace with God. As Paul says in Ephesians, as once you were, as once you were, but God being rich in mercy. The believers at Thessalonica were indeed suffering such consequence from those from without. And Paul had good reason for concern, as we should for the church today, as we see See the church melting under all that is being presented by the world, and yet God is sanctifying the church. He's refining the church, refining, refining each one of us. How do we respond to such concern? As we began to look at last week a little bit, there in verse 17 through 20 of chapter 2, reminded that Paul, we looked at ultimately four things that we begin to look at here in our study God, the passion for the church, the provision for the church, praise for the church, the petition for the church. We see with the Apostle Paul, we begin there in verse 17 with passion. Paul's passion, we brethren, but we brethren, having been taken away from you for a short time, for a short while rather, in person, not in spirit, were all the more eager with great desire to see your face. Paul's passion was relentless for the church. He was bereaved from them, orphaned from them. We we're all more eager, all the more eager, with a great desire to see your face. And again, we mentioned that how many were during COVID wanting to see each other's face. And the statistics now from one year to the, to the next about the condoning of worship apart from gathering together as a church. So if we have a passion which we should, the answer to the concern for the church is the passion for the church. And you ask yourself, what kind of passion do I have for the church? We, we sang it this morning. If we have passion, we're going to have a plan. We talked about that last week. You have a passion about something? You have a plan for it. I'm going to go to your house and I look at your passions, which are not a bad thing. I said they're a great thing. But you planned it. Some of you landscape. Right? You've landscaped it out. You have a passion for landscape, passion for gardens. Some of your gardens are laid out like, you know, I mean, like you could live in it. It's great. But you have a plan. The same way with our relationship with, and, and God's calling for us in the church. The plan. And again, Paul says here, for we wanted to come to you and I, Paul, more than once, and yet Satan hindered us. And it wasn't a plan that, that was thwarted. It says, why, more than once, was, well, okay, it's not going to work out. And we're that way too. If something doesn't work out, we find a way to make it work. We find a way to make it work. Because we're passionate about it. We're passionate. And I'm grateful for those. There are some who, who, who have the gift of passion, and I'm grateful for them. They get it done. They don't, have, they don't take no for an answer. They know how to get things done. What was Paul's motivation? I love it. Paul's pleasure. For who is our hope or, or joy or crown of exaltation? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming? For you are our glory and joy. Paul's pleasure was to serve Christ and to present 
Lord, these as his joy and his crown. And we talked about God's promise and provision and his, his rewards, the Stephanos, the crown, to lay at the Lord's feet. It's, and Paul says, my, my, my blessing to serve is it's my pleasure for the glory of Christ. You are my joy, my hope of glorifying God. My joy. Now, all this being said, as we look on here in our text, in these next verses, we see that Paul continues to pursue and make plans in his concern for the church. As we see here, Paul was unable to go. He was unable to, to he was hindered from it, but he did not stop in carrying out the work of the Lord. Nothing would stop him. And so we see here that he sent Timothy, and as we look at the, the, these next verses, verses in chapter 3, 1 through 4, we see that Paul was not just wanting Timothy to see if everything was, anything was left, right? It wasn't like visiting Florida and saying, is there anything left, you know, any houses there? It was to go and to minister to them. Not just to report back, but rather to give the church the essential provisions they needed to live and stand firm in the Lord. As he tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 8, For now we really live if you stand firm in the Lord. And here we see this in these verses 1 through 4. Three provisions I want to share with you here. And we certainly will see more as we see prayer later. But three of them, that is the worker of God, the word of God, and the will of God. Provisions for the church to stand firm in the Lord. The worker of God, the word of God, the will of God. Notice these with me. First, the worker of God. He says here, Paul writes, Therefore, when we could endure it no longer, we thought it best to be left behind at Athens alone. And, and we sent Timothy, our brother and God's fellow worker, in the gospel. Here we see again Paul's passion and his plan. He's seeking himself to come after exhausting every resource to be able to come, not able to endure it any longer, he's knowing that, not knowing what had come or become of the Thessalonians, he here sends Timothy. Now, we, we should be familiar with Timothy. Timothy was a young man who was brought up in the Word of God by his mother and grandmother. You remember that from, it was told in, in 2 Timothy. It's important mothers, the time that you have with your children. And fathers as well, but oftentimes moms have more time of being home. Taught him the scriptures from childhood. Paul likely led him to Christ on his first missionary journey. And then on his second missionary journey, we see in Acts 16, verses 1 through 3, we see that, that Paul calls him and commissions him with him to go on the mission field. And many of us can relate more to Timothy than the Apostle Paul for obvious reasons. Right? If you're in a crowd, you're going to want to talk, go up and talk to Apostle Paul or Timothy. Timothy's probably a little bit more, less trepidatious. And here we see that Paul sends Timothy as part of, a part of his plan. In doing so, he reflects uh, God's provision for the church. God's provision for the church. What is God's provision? What is the provision, first provision? It's people. It really, when we look at it, it's, it's each one of us. It's each one of us. And Paul clearly expresses this, calling Timothy here a fellow worker. He says, Timothy's our brother and God's fellow worker in the gospel. By this, Paul means that Timothy was a worker and minister of the gospel given by God to do the work it is not that God needs us, but rather that he has chosen to use and to work through both men and women to do the work of ministry for those who we redeem, to redeem. And we think about this as, as in relation to our calling, right, to the Great Commission. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. And do what? Teaching them. 
teaching them. It doesn't just mean the pastor. It doesn't mean the elders. It means if you lead someone to Christ, you should be discipling them. You should be discipling them. And doing so, we, we are equipped to do the work that God has called us to do. Paul tells us that, that God builds up the body of Christ. Ephesians chapter 4, 11 through 12. He gave some as apostles, some as prophets. This is the, the main course in which God teaches the church through, the, through those whom he called to be teachers. Some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to building up of the body of Christ. Notice here, it's not only God's call, does God call and equip evangelists and pastors, but, but notice he equips all the saints for the work of service, each one of us. In fact, Paul tells us that God only equips us, but he, he gifts us for the work. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good, for the work of service, for the church, each one of us. So then we ask the question, what is the major part of God's provision for the church to stand in, in the Lord, to walk in faith? It's you, it's me, made able by the Holy Spirit. It is God who accomplishes the work, but we are the hands and feet that God chooses to do. God chooses to work through fellow workers. And that God would choose to, to, to work through human agents should bring a whole different perspective on our ministry and understanding that God has called each one of us. He tells us not to neglect the, the gift that he's given to us. So how do you see yourself? How do I see myself? Are you passionate about the church as a fellow worker of the gospel? Do you see that, that God has called you as a fellow worker? I don't care how old you are, young and old. Or should I say older, sorry. Look back at our text and notice that it's not without willing sacrifice either. He says, I thought it best to be left behind at Athens and so I sent Timothy. This word here, uh, left behind, nobody likes to be left behind. How many of you like to be left behind? People take off, they just left me. It's not a good feeling. I always got left behind when I was in, at recess. They'd always count, and guess who got counted last? Oh, we'll take Caton. So if you're in that category, I, I know how you feel. I was left behind. I was the last one. Always the, okay, you take him. The depravity of men starts young from birth, right? We were born in sin. It comes out very clearly in grade school. At least when you're in kindergarten, they just throw things at you. But they use, they use words when you get in grade school. So, all right. Sorry, I'm having a meltdown here in the pulpit, so probably some counseling afterwards. That's all right. But this word here that, that Paul uses, it means to abandon. <laughs> it's, I mean, he's like, I, I, I'm willing to be abandoned. I thought it best to be abandoned and left it out. He uses the, pro, the, the plural pronoun we, uh, but he often does that, even speaking of himself. Uh, maybe it be that that he was not alone, that, that he still had there his uh, other workers, but he definitely was alone, left. Silas was probably already, already been sent out, probably maybe the Derby. But at any rate, Paul definitely said, I'm, I'm willing to go alone. I'm willing to send my ministry partner here in Athens among all these, all these uh, false gods and and, and it was also a stress for Tim. You can imagine Tim said, I don't want to go. Would you want me to go? Have you ever asked when the pastor says, hey, would you do this? Well, I don't want to do that. And especially, uh, young, you know, just to be asked by yourself, hey, would you, would you do this for me? Would you stand up and say this or share this? I ain't going to share that. 
Because it, it, sometimes it's a little overwhelming. I ask people, if you've asked people to give an announcement from Sunday morning, it's like, I'm not standing up there. Because, they, because you look out in the audience and see you, it's kind of scary for, for uh, sometimes. But think about it. If God asks you to do something, we've talked about this. If God asks you to do something, if you're asked, it can be costly. We talked about this several weeks ago, the cost of ministry. And so here, Paul speaks here of this provision for the church. It's the worker, the workers of God, your fellow workers. This cost Paul. He's willing to to go it alone to work for the gospel. The same again of true of Timothy. Now, why would they make this sacrifice? Again, as we looked last Sunday, it was because for the glory of God. It's for the glory of God. Paul was looking past the peripheral to the eternal. And so, what is God's provision for the church to stand firm for the Lord? Look around you at your look around at your fellow workers here. This is God's provision. We're all called as fellow servants of the gospel. Notice, secondly, that that we're not given the task without direction. Timothy was sent with a task. Notice the purpose statement here. He says here in our text, speaking of this provision, the word of God. Paul says to Timothy, says we, we send Timothy, our brother, and God's fellow worker in the gospel, of Christ's purpose statement to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith, as to your walk, as to your, your, what you believe, all you believe, your faith in Christ, your relationship with Christ, to encourage you into it. And this was the purpose of, of, uh, for which Timothy was sent. Paul was not sure that what Timothy would find concerning the church, but we know, from, as we know from verse 5, that he imagined the worst but also finding faith was believed that there would be faith, that it would not be all lost. There was some optimism, believing that he would find those who were walking with the Lord, those who had believed. And as noted, he had certainly much to be concerned about because of the persecution. And we have certainly much to be concerned about as well as we live really in the same depraved world, the same depraved realities that we face every day as you go out into the world, we just don't know what's going to happen or who's going to show up at our door. And it's by no means easy to walk by faith in a world that stands against us not only the world that stands against us, but by no means easy because the sin of, of our flesh that so easily entangles us that Hebrews tells us, Paul, or the writer of Hebrews tells us. I love this passage in Hebrews, a writer stating these truths tells us that we are in a race, a race of endurance. He says, run the race with endurance set before us, fixing our eyes on who? The author and the perfecter of our faith. Who is that? Jesus. Jesus, and I love this endurance. This endurance. And we are coming into a time of endurance. Things are going to get more difficult, I believe. We must endure and not give up and not grow weary, not grow faint, but to remain passionate. Fix our eyes, to fix our eyes on Jesus is to fix our eyes on his word. Jesus is the word. John 1.1. 1, 1. And here Timothy sent, sent, was sent to strengthen and to encourage these believers in their faith. Their faith, again, refers to their walk with Christ, their, their endurance race. This centrally obviously falls on pastors and elders, calling to proclaim the word of Christ and shepherd the flock as we, we see in Scripture. But also, it falls on us as believers, each one of us. Each one of us. This word strengthen is is 
is a word that means to, to make stable, to establish something firmly, right? To firmly establish, to, to make sure people are, are going deep into the word, that their faith is founded, that it's not peripheral. And so you ask yourself, where is your faith? How deep is it? What do you desire? Are you growing deeper in Christ's word so that you'll be able to stand on the rock of your salvation? Because when the storms come, and they will come, where do you stand? What do you believe? Where is your hope? Timothy's task was to establish the believers firmly in their faith, to strengthen them in their faith, which comes by again through the word of God. This is to be coupled with, with encouragement. Encouragement, a fuller, a fuller definition of this word also in the original gives a, an additional understanding. It's a fact a word uh, that you should know in the Greek. It's, it's, it's prolifically found in the scripture. It is a word that means literally to call to one side. It's parakaleo. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? It should because we've... It's a, it's a word, again, that's used over and over again. The Scripture is used of the Holy Spirit, the one who's called beside, literally to call one's side. To, it applies coming to one side to encourage, to comfort, to, to, to appeal to someone or to urge someone to action. So you can see this picture. He is there to come and, and strengthen them and to urge them in their faith, to encourage them and to apply it. You may recall from our study in the first half of the book of Acts that this is really the example of Paul. Turn over to Acts chapter 14, verse 22. Acts chapter 14, verse 22. You probably remember this account. Paul is on his first missionary journey, and it's while he's in Lystra. And remember he healed a, a man who was lame from birth. And the Greeks there who, uh, they're... Uh, <laughs> began to respond to both Paul and Barnabas believing they were Greek gods and they were bringing them sacrifices. You remember that? And Paul says, no, wait a minute. I'm not here to draw attention to myself. I mean, there's a tons of sarcastic things I could say about this, about some who almost think of themselves in the pulpit that way. But Paul made clear that they were not, and the Jews stirred up the crowd, and, and they stoned Paul, and they left him for dead. Remember, they took him outside of town, they stoned him and left him for dead. They thought he was dead, and then they went out to look at him and just got up. Yeah, Paul has passion. And he went back into the city, and then he went to Derby. And then he made his way back to Lystra afterwards, visiting all these towns. And what does verse 42 say? Or 22 say? It says this. Strengthening the souls of the disciples. Encouraging them to continue in the faith. Sounds familiar. And saying, through many tribulations, you must enter the kingdom of God. It's Paul's message. That's Paul's message. This is Paul's example. You know, if you want to learn how to share and to encourage and to, and to strengthen the body, you need to get with those who are already doing it. It's called discipleship. You need to watch others. You need to set in on others and set in on other things. In fact, even, even to, uh, to uh, uh, get a, uh, go, go to school in, in biblical counseling, they, they require hours and hours of, of sitting with another counselor, watching them counsel others. If you want to know how to minister, you need to be in the Word of God. I, uh, I made a copy. I don't think I see I have it here. Yeah. Just to make, make an example, I have a, I, uh, a book in my office. It's, 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 it's by one of the early Puritans, Richard Baxter. And it's called The Christian Directory. Uh, 
it is basically what God's word says pretty much about every situation. He, he had some time on his hands. It says this, a Christian directory, or he writes, a sum of practical theology and cases of conscience directing Christians how to use their knowledge and faith. It means how to apply the word of God. This is what the word of God says. This is how to apply it. How to improve all helps and means and to perform all duties. How to overcome temptations and to escape, the, or, or, to escape or mortify every sin. It's about this thick, small type. Not going to read it in a few days. But that's the wealth of Scripture. That God has the answer. The Word has the answer. And you can go to all kinds of other books and get all kinds of platitudes, but it's not going to meet the need of the moment. The Word of God is like a scalpel. We read in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. And as believers... We need to be able to apply the truth to encourage the saints because those around you are struggling. Some of you are struggling with various issues. It may be from relationships to just your own walk with the Lord. And what are you going to say with them? You know, that's, a, that's, a, that's too bad. You should go talk to pastor. I'm just one person. Did you read the scripture? Fellow worker of God. And yes, if it feels like it's too much, Come to, to, to one of the pastors, one of the elders, or another, another uh, Bible teacher in the church. That's why we read in Scripture in Titus, older men, older women, teach so you can learn and direct and be able to strengthen and encourage the saints because you are a fellow worker of God. You have the word of God. I don't think there was a lot of, I don't think there was a Christian bookstore back in Baxter's day. Books were kind of hard to come by. There wasn't every genre on the bookshelf that was just the word of God, which is hard to get as it was. And men and women died for it. And now, unfortunately, we look for every word but the word of God to meet our needs, and ultimately is to justify our sins. I was looking of all the psychology, all the new isms. I think the, uh, there's a, there's, I, forget, uh, I forget the name of the, the categories, but it's almost doubled the number of isms, issues that people have. Like, you know, behavior disorder means basically you don't discipline your kids, but there's a disorder. And so there's justification for it. And it hurts the family. It actually hurts your child. Proverbs tells us that. Hate your child, don't discipline them. Yes, I know there's other nuances to it, but God's word does answer those. Look over at Acts chapter 15, verse 32, again. Acts 15, verse 32, we see here that Paul and Barnabas were returning from Antioch, and they found there at Antioch there were those who came from Judea, and they were telling them that you need to, you need to uh, uh, have the Gentiles that need to be circumcised and following the the laws of the Jews for them, for them to be saved. And Paul and Barnabas obviously didn't set well with them. And the church, being a biblical church, sent them down to Judea, find out what's going on down to Jerusalem. And so they went down there the, and they met. Do you remember the council? James says, listen, and sent them back with a message, says, told them that, told the Gentiles this is the message, you need to abstain from, from these things so that you don't cause the Jews to stumble, but you are not to, you don't have to take on the Jewish customs to be saved, obviously, nor the Jews to be saved. For salvation is by grace through faith. Remember Peter making it very clear. And so they sent not only Paul and Barnabas back, but they sent Judas and Silas. 
And notice what it says in chapter 15, verse 32. What were they doing again? Judas and Silas also being prophets themselves, encouraged and what? Strengthened, same words, the brethren with a lengthy message. That's most pastor's life verse right there. This is the ministry of the word applied by men and women, the women of God, ultimately, as we see through Scripture, as we are to encourage one another, walk in this, as we walk in this world, uh, the Christian, is, it's not an easy task. It's difficult, as we mentioned. The temptation are always before us. They, they easily entangle us. And, and in fact, I, I think you're probably thinking of some of the, the sins that entangle you right now, the struggles you're having in your life. And we need one another. We need accountability. We need men who pray for each other, women who pray for each other, those who hold each other accountable to help sanctify one another. God uses each one of us to sanctify. He uses, uses our spouses to sanctify us. Who loves you more than your spouse to say and point out sins in your life? Don't let pride get in the way of looking and seeing they have your best interests. The word is a sword for our lives. We need to be encouraged by the word and stand in I love Paul, Romans 15, 4. Romans 15, 4, for whatever was written earlier times was written for our instruction so that through perseverance, we've shared this many times, and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Think about it this week. That I might have hope. Look at, uh, I love Psalms 19, 25. I'm just going to rattle off a bunch of verses. Verse 25, my soul cleaves to the dust. Revive me according to your word, he says. Verse 88, revive me according to your loving kindness so that I may keep the testimony of your mouth. Verse 92, he says, if your law had not been my delight, then I would have perished in my affliction. Think about that. If I didn't have your word, I would have perished. I would have had no hope. 105, thy word, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. 107, I am exceedingly afflicted. Revive me, O Lord, according to your word. 43 to 44, trouble and anguish have come upon me, yet your commandments are my delight. Your testimonies are are righteous forever. Give me understanding that I may live. They may have hope. If you can just see David, the Holy Spirit working through him and giving those to us in his own life and ours. Again, it's the duty of all and and in part, and in part why, and is in part why we need to gather as a church. We need to need to come together. And in fact, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 through 25 should be so familiar to us. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another in love and good deeds. And notice, remember this verse so important. Not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but in what? Encouraging one another all the more as we see the day drawing near. Encouraging. With the word of God. The Word of God. It's a provision. God's provision to stand for the Lord really and really to really live in our faith. God's provision for that is the workers of God. And secondly, God's provision to stand firm and really live is the Word of God. Now notice thirdly, not only the Word of God, not only the workers of God, not only the Word of God, but notice thirdly, the will of God. The will of God. Look at verses 3 to 4. This is so precious, so good. Notice here that the word of God makes clear the will of God. Paul writes, and he sent Timothy, his brother, our brother of God, a fellow worker in the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you as to the faith so that no one would be disturbed, he says, or afflicted, right? By these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we have been destined for this 
For indeed, when we were with you, we kept telling you in advance that we were going to suffer affliction. So as to, so, so it came to pass, as you know. God's provision for us to stand firm also includes God's will foretold in his word. And here in this context, Paul is speaking obviously of difficulties, of the result of the gospel, persecution, rejection. And this is what was happening to the Thessalonians. This is what happens to the believer, and we should not be surprised by it. In fact, Peter tells us as much in 1 Peter 4.12. Beloved, do not be surprised by this fiery ordeal among you. Paul reminds them that he had made this clear to them in advance, in advance, that this is, was not the unknown. This is not something to be surprised about. As believers, we don't look to the present or the future with uncertainty or without understanding. Think about that. God has told us, God has made clear his will and what to expect in both in his, this world and in to the future. Well, things to come. All of which is written here in his word. All which is written for our comfort. Our security. Think about this. Jesus made this clear to his disciples. Look over to John chapter 15. John chapter 15, verse 18. This is before his crucifixion. He's, he's in the upper room. He's, he's foretelling of his death and his resurrection. He's giving them the Lord's table. And what would happen to them in advance. And he's telling them what would happen to them in advance so they would... Not be shaken. And so Jesus tells them, look at verses 15, uh, verse uh, 18 and following. He says this, If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If they persecute me, he says, they will persecute you. I'm telling you this in advance. Notice in chapter 16, verse 1, just turn the page over. In 16, verse 1, as they're going out, he concludes here, he says, These things I have spoken to you so that you may be kept from what? Stumbling. I have told you in advance so you don't stumble. Don't be surprised by it. He goes on and says, They will make you outcasts from the synagogues, but an hour is coming for everyone who kills you, who kills you to think that they are offering service to God. Certainly that's a situation in our our world, isn't it? Those who kill thinking they're doing a service to God. Even to the less subtle, as I said in California, love your neighbor is actually making abortion legal. We're doing the work of God. These things they will do because they have not known the Father or me. For these things I have spoken to you, that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told you them. Why would he tell in advance? That's why when you go out and your kid's in the car, hey, be careful. Watch out for this. Watch out on this particular road because there's a lot of animals that you come. You, why do you tell them that? So they know in advance so that they won't, won't happen or when it does come. Or when they see it, they slow down. And we can make, and you can come up with several examples of it in your own mind. Again, he closes. Look at verse 33 of John. should be 16. 1633, these things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. Don't be overwhelmed. I've got it. Right? The Great Commission, I am with you, even to the end of the age. This is why Peter again later speaks, as I mentioned in verse, chapter 4, verse 12 of 1 Peter. Don't be surprised by the fire ordeal or, or 
In fact, he tells the Philippians in chapter 1, verse 29, he says this, it has been granted to us not only to, be, to believe upon Christ, but to what? Suffer for his sake. Wait a minute. I didn't see that in the Christian, I, uh, God has a wonderful plan for your life uh, tract. God was going to use you for his glory. We as believers have a clear picture of the world and the, and the difficulties we, we can expect and, and their purpose and our response. James chapter 1, 1 through 5. Consider all joy, my brethren, when you count various trials. We know God's will concerning the future. We're going to look at that in chapter 4, verse 13. Right? But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep. Those who have passed away do not grieve as those of the rest of the world who have no hope. You don't have to be that person. Because you go to the Word of God and this is what it says. And this is what I believe. And this is what I hold to. If not, you're going to be like a ship tossed about by the sea. That's what Paul says in chapter 4. That's why we are builds up the body. So that we might be moved and thrown about by every wind of doctrine. False teaching. This is what God says, and you have to come to the point, do I believe it or I don't believe it? Here's the point where the rubber meets the road. We have this difficulty in my life. Am I going to trust God or not? Is he on the throne or is he not on the throne? Is he the God of the Word or is he not the God of the Word? Now, when you're counseling somebody, just don't go throw the Word at them. Well, you just need to do this. You need to go come alongside, parakaleo, come alongside of them, listen to them. You may have to even, even just pray with them because they might not be ready to receive the word of God because they already know it. They just need somebody there to be with them and who knows their situation, a man and woman of God. That's what Paul says, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, right? Comfort those in the way you've been comforted. Think about why God takes you through certain trials. Because he's sanctifying you and he's going to use you to sanctify others. And you might be saying, I I'm tired of experiencing everything else everyone's going to experience, right? That's, I get it. Been there. But God is good in it because he wants to use you. And so we live in light of it. Titus, let's close with this. Titus chapter 2. Verses 11 through 13, for God tells us not only the will of God for the future, he tells us the will of God, what we're to be doing right now in light of his return. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. We are running an endurance race. This is the water. This is the substance. This is your hydration. And some of you this morning might be in badly need of it because you haven't been in it. What's your plan? It will reflect your passion. What's your pleasure? Remember, this is the provision. The worker of God. God has already enabled you. He's, in, he's, he's gifted you. You have the word of God. And he's revealed his will. Isn't it nice walking in the light? Think about why people are so fearful because they're walking in the dark. And you need to be a city on a hill. I need to be a city on a hill. And show them the light. Live it. Live it. And we need it as a church. I need you. I need you in my life. Even if it's a little candy on the pulpit. 
Father, thank you so much for your blessing. Lord, thank you that you don't leave us in darkness. That even in the midst of the most difficult times, Father, you are with us. You've never leave us nor forsake us. And Father, you raise up people around us, Lord, to come. And Lord, we are your workers, your fellow workers of the gospel of Christ. And Father, thank you, Father, that Lord, we can encourage each other and we are to call to do so all the more as we see the day approaching. God, we are never alone because you are with us. And Lord, our brothers and sisters are standing beside us. And so it is, may we be those who sharpen iron, may we be those who walk humbly with each other, that we carry each other at times, and at times that we can be carried. For we are those who are, Lord, often, uh, often fall into weakness, and we need each other to lead us back to the water. We thank you, Father. If there's one here this morning who doesn't know you as their Savior, that, God, they would recognize their, their great need because of the sin that separated us from you and there's no peace with you or they are enemies with you. And the only way they can have, Lord, the judgment that is deserved for sin as a righteous God who must judge is to find forgiveness and one who can give payment and justification, and that is the Son whom God sent because he loves you, who took upon himself the sin that you sinned against the Heavenly Father, and Jesus took upon the wrath meant for you as if he sinned your sins because of his great love for you, and he's willing to offer you salvation and his righteousness to stand before Christ based on his merits, not you. So when you stand before God, it is Christ covering you, Christ's merit that cleanses you through his blood shed on the cross. And so if you're not saved today, if you don't, if you never trusted Christ, will you bow your knee to Christ right here and right now and say, Jesus, I am a sinner. And if I stood before you now, I'd be deserved of, deserving of condemnation because, Lord, I am guilty before you, a righteous and holy God who cannot have sin in his presence. And I believe, Jesus, that you sent God in human flesh who became like me yet without sin so that he could be my advocate, my, my sin bearer, the one who took upon himself my sin. And he gave me his righteousness as if I lived his life. And I believe, Lord, come into my life. Holy Spirit, come into me. And I want to live for you. And I want to be strengthened. I want to dig deep. I want to be, Lord, a man or woman of faith. So would you believe this morning? Thank you, Jesus, that is by grace we are saved through faith. It's not of ourselves. It's not by works. Lord, our boast is in you alone. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand with me as we close?